Okay, we're going to get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our workshop, Weaving Language with Kim McCollum. My name is Michael Magnuson. I'm the new public program and outreach coordinator at the Art Gallery of Alberta. To start this program, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. The AGA is located in Edmonton, which is on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional land of a diverse Indigenous peoples, including Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Inuit, and Ojibwe, Salto, Anishinaabe. We acknowledge and extend gratitude to the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations and who continue to call this place home today. This program will start by having Kim introduce their work in the scene exhibition. Then Kim will introduce the weaving activity and teach you how to make a simple loom and weaving. At the end of the program, there will be a few moments for a Q&A with Kim. Uh, also feel free to ask uh, questions or if you have any things that you would like Kim to troubleshoot throughout the workshop. Uh, this event is part of the public program for the exhibition, The Scene at the AGA, curated by Lindsay Sharman and Danielle Siemens. The Scene celebrates what's happening in art right now in Edmonton. This exhibition presents exciting and experimental work from artists based in or closely connected to Edmonton. The Scene puts the spotlight on emerging to mid-career practices while presenting a cross-section of the city's art scene. Uh, it's cur currently on display, so you can check it out at the AGA uh, whenever you have a chance. This program is being recorded and will be shared at a later date. If you don't want to be recorded, you can hide your video. If you're comfortable, please have your video and mic on during this workshop. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors. Our public programs are made possible in part through support from the Heart and Soul Fund by EPCOR. Uh, now I would like to introduce Kim. Uh, Kim McCollum's work explores relationships between digital and analog, old and new, hand and machine. As technology advances, and our world shifts towards the digital, society is losing the tactic and material knowledge formed by making things by hand. McCollum's work explores how ancient craft practices and contemporary technology are linked. McCollum holds an MFA from the University of Alberta and is a creator of networks within a local craft and arts community in Edmonton, connecting people and ideas through her work as an artist, event organizer, and as an educator. She co-owns Gather Textiles, a workshop space and community, community building initiative. Uh, without further delay, here is Kim. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And um, thank you to Michael for that introduction and to Helen for getting us set up with all the tech today. And thank you to the AGA for having me. Um, it's so exciting to actually be able to um, do a workshop, even though I realize it's not quite the same as having something in person. And I appreciate you taking the time to be here with me. Um, so without any further ado, I think I'll dive right in. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing a bit about my work at the AGA and some reasons why weaving has captivated me personally. And then I'll show you how to create your own weaving using things that hopefully you have with you today um, and you might have just had lying around the house. You might not finish your entire weaving today and that's okay, but hopefully you'll have the skills you need to finish it on your own afterwards. So in the exhibition, the scene, I have both weavings and paintings on display. And in this image here, you can see the weavings are on the left of the screen in a cluster together. And then there's three large paintings. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see um, that these paintings are quite large, they're 72 by 80 inches, and they really came out of my experience learning to weave. So I'll start there. Um, when I was first trying to figure out how to weave on my own, I was doing things like looking on YouTube and trying to learn online. And I really found that it wasn't the best way to learn. It was a great way to learn some really basic skills, but with weaving, the complexity of it, the reality is you really need to learn in person or you need to learn from an expert and those kinds of things were really hard to find online. Weaving can take a lifetime really to explore the complexities of it and um, learning from other people really became the one way for me to kind of dive deeper into that. Um, so I started collecting things like books and old samples and things that were passed down to me through members of the Edmonton Weavers Guild and I have some of those samples here today that I'll show you. Um, let me just see which, um, can people see this camera too? Oh yes, I, I'll hold some things up. So 
weavers like to trade patterns and they do that often either with paper patterns or by um, actually making little samples and sharing them with each other. And these are some samples from old books that have been given to me. And these little samples hold a lot of knowledge once you know how to kind of read them. I'm not sure what the light is like. I'm hoping you can kind of see these. So these, I started learning how to understand about weaving by taking these things apart. And while I was collecting these samples, I was also collecting stories that came with them. Um, so certain patterns are often associated with certain things and handed down and shared kind of like recipes. Um, the diamond shapes are often referencing things like protection. Hound's tooth is a symbol for wealth. Um, and it's a tradition to trade these sorts of things or even trade full tea towels in weaving communities. Um, gifts are all often given of handwoven baby blankets or wedding blankets or tea towels and there's different symbols that are associated with different patterns that are given. Um, and often people talk, weavers talk about the idea that each thread is touched by the weaver in the process of making a textile. Um, so we'll just hop back to the paintings just for a second, Helen. Um, thank you. These, these three paintings are based on the structure of overshot. And that's the weaving term to describe how the threads hop over more than one thread at a time. Uh, it's quite complex and I won't dive into too much of how they're actually made. Um, but the history of overshot um, was used to create coverlets. So these paintings are about the size of a bedspread. And because the motif was symbolic um, for things like protection and comfort. With these particular overshot structures, there's a center point. So the idea is that the pattern can kind of expand and repeat indefinitely. So these paintings were made originally by dissecting some of the little samples like I showed you um, that were handed down to me and uploading them into a computer program to help expand them. It can also be done by hand um, and then eventually translating those expanded patterns into something in paint. And so the actual little sample that I had didn't look at all like the paintings, but they were kind of like a small key or code um, for what the paintings ended up being. So Overshot has its roots in European weaving, but became popular in the US and Canada in about the 1700s. Um, I also just wanted to mention a bit about my personal connection to textiles. Um, as a child, when my mom would add things to my hope chest. So I don't know if, if people have heard that term before, but I come from a Mennonite family and a hope chest was a, a box or a chest that was used to collect linens that would be given to the daughter. Usually it was the eldest daughter, which is me and my family um, when they go out and get married. And there's a lot about this tradition that I don't necessarily hold, like I kind of wholeheartedly reject the idea of, you know, collecting linens to be, doing the dishes and making the beds, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's also something beautiful about that too, about collecting these handmade things that are from my family and these textiles that were really valued as symbols of, of care and love being passed down. Um, so that was kind of my personal connection to collecting these things like these small samples and like handwoven tea towels. So the paintings I make are made in the effort to understand or visualize weaving as a form of communication or language and as a way of holding the language of women that is passed down and evolved through generations. It's also a way of bringing attention to knowledge that I feel is slowly getting lost, but also bringing attention to ways that it is very much present in society, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So we can move on to the, the weaving drafts on the next slide. Weaving information is passed down in the form of paper patterns called drafts, and they can be read in any language because they're made of shapes that are similar across cultures. So these are just two examples in these images here. Um, I've been trading drafts recently with a Moroccan weaver that I met um, when I went there in 2018. And although he doesn't speak English um, and I don't speak Arabic, <laughs> I think it's a really interesting way of being able to communicate back and forth just based on these codes. And so there's this kind of really exciting moment when these codes are passed to me via email or in the mail, and then I can weave the actual fabric without having seen the fabric being made in Morocco. So that's just an example to kind of share how um, 
that these patterns are something that are able to be passed and they are a language in and of themselves um, without needing to be translated in any way. These particular samples are by Margaret Willers. Um, she was a weaver at the Bauhaus and they're currently in an archive at the Met Museum. So I think for me, one of the beautiful things about weaving is that it's the result of this collective work of people, um, primarily women around the world who have built up this body of knowledge that over time has this incredibly powerful way of thinking and understanding the world. And on the next slide here, um, you can see a close up of one of the paintings and each square represents one intersection where one vertical thread meets one horizontal thread. And so in a way, these paintings are made like the weavings are, that you're going to make today in that um, there's this horizontal and vertical um, structures that are connecting in order to make certain patterns. On the next slide, there's a, a quote um, from a really fabulous book that I recommend to anybody interested in this topic. Um, from our first direct evidence 20,000 years ago, cloth has been the handiest solution to conveying social messages visually, silently, continuously. And I really like this quote, I think, because it really seems to emphasize the fact that communicating through cloth isn't something that's necessarily very um, noticed. It often goes unrecognized because these messages are silent, they are visual. Um, and it's something that I think we're just as a society starting to recognize and understand and learn more about now as the work of particularly women artists are starting to is, get recognized on a larger scale. And then on the next slide here, um, I love some good etymology. So I had to just throw a couple of words in here. Um, the etymology, etym etymological traces of the connection between weaving and writing or language is evident in numerous languages and cultures. And you can see in English here how uh, weaving and fibers and textiles has really um, made its way into our language. And um, we've probably used many, if not all of these words um, in your day to day, especially now thinking about things like the net, the internet and how there's this relationship between textiles and the digital world, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment. We're going to move on to some some basics about looms because the looms that we're going to be making today um, are these tiny little things and you can yes and I put our little photo of this little guy on the far left and it's almost to scale but if I actually made it to scale you wouldn't really be able to see the one that we're using um, so this is the, kind of the most simple loom that you can possibly use um, but I wanted to share just a little bit about what looms are out there so this is just a tiny sample of the huge number of looms that are make, being made now and that have been used in the past. Um, the second from the left is a rigid heddle loom. And that means that it just has two sets of threads that are, or has one set of threads that's able to be either raised or lowered in a really simple kind of way. And then in the one to the right of that, it has a four different shafts. And I can't, don't have time today to get into how the mechanisms of that work, but it allows you to create all sorts of different kinds of patterns. Like in um, this example, this is a four shaft weaving pattern. And you can see that it's quite a lot more intricate than um, what we'll be doing today. And then furthest to the right is a punch card loom, which is an early jacquard loom. Um, and it's a type of loom that uses cards to raise and lower different shafts. So it makes the loom work in a certain kind of way. And it's, it's, um, it was a stepping stone towards the first computer. And the first computer used punch cards that were inspired by the weaving loom. And that's a connection that I find um, really interesting and important because I think often the contributions of women to this part of technology go um, unnoticed and untalked about or not talked about. And I think this is kind of a really important moment in history when um, this kind of collective knowledge that had been created by generations of primarily women um, weavers just kind of takes off and becomes this um, incredible force in the development of humanity in terms of computers and then eventually the internet. Um, I think I won't get too far into this or else I could go on about this for quite a while, but I just like the, the idea of how it gets really complicated when this way of thinking of either over, under, or 
um, if the thread goes over another thread or under another thread. In weaving, yes, the answer is either over or under, but there's also a lot of in-between things. Um, in, in the way that, you know, a fabric can spread out, it can squish, it can form to your body. But then when this way of thinking got translated into computer technology, it's either a zero or it's a one in computer code, and there's no room for that kind of in between. And so I think that's kind of an important distinction between um, what happens on a weaving loom and then what happened with this transition of technology to computers. I'll leave, I'll leave that there for now, but if you're interested in that kind of Thing. Let's talk later about that. All right, weaving 101. This is going to be the fastest, like, how, what is weaving that I've done. Okay, so you have your warp and you have your weft. On our little loom here, the warp is this brown hemp thread that's going vertically and it's held under tension and it's represented in blue in this image. And then the weft is what you're going to be using to go over and under each warp thread back and forth horizontally on your loom. So the process of weaving involves the interlacement of those two sets of thread. And the second set of threads that's called the weft is manipulated by the weaver after the loom is set up. Um, the most basic of weave structures or interlacements is called plain weave. And that's just over, under, over, under, like is shown in this image. And that's where we're going to start today. Um, and plain weave is the most strong and the most stable of weave structures and is the basis of all weaving. So if you are a total newbie today, this is exactly where you should be starting. So we're gonna go ahead and make a loom together. Um, and you don't need a lot. You need a cardboard box. Um, the lid of a shoe box works really well, but the actual shoe box works too. I like to have something that's fairly sturdy because I don't want my loom falling apart. And you're going to need to put some kind of tension on your loom as you use it. So um, you don't want it totally caving in on you. So the example when I did is just a tiny little box like this. The one that I'm going to be using today is a bit bigger. Um, and the first thing you want to do is you need to cut little spaces for the thread to fit. And I've done one side already, and I'm going to just hold this up so you can kind of see. Oops, other side. Okay, so I've made these little slits in the top of my box. And the slits go down about half a centimeter, and they're about mm, just under a centimeter in terms of width. This isn't an exact science. It kind of depends what kind of yarn you have, but that's a good place to start. If you have thicker yarn, wider spacing is better. If you have thinner yarn, thinner spacing is better. Um, but if you do these spaces too close together, you'll find that the cardboard won't be strong enough and things will kind of start to cave in on you. So for the purposes of today, I've made about between 10 and 15 little slots here. And I'm going to make 10 or 15 little slots on the opposite side of my box. Um, that line up as closely as possible. So you can see I have an open box here. So if you have a box that's closed all the way, like if you're using a cereal box or something, you'll want to um, make sure that you open one end of it so you have a top that's open. And I've cut the sides kind of out of this one. And I've done that on my sample one too, but a lot more subtly. You can kind of see the side profile here, just subtle. It's just enough so that the sides of the box stay out of your way while you're weaving. So as you kind of work on that, I'm going to be cutting the slots in my box on the other side. And maybe I'll go over here so you can kind of see from the top down what I'm doing. I'm going to count to make sure I have the same number on both sides. So I'm just going to kind of keep powering through here. And if you're still making your loom while I'm doing this next part, that is totally okay. So 
So weaving can be done with just about any kind of yarn, but some yarn is better than others. And for your warp yarn, so if you remember, that's the yarn that's gonna be held under tension on our looms. We wanna find something that's fairly strong and not too stretchy. Cotton is ideal for new weavers, um, but because we're just kind of using whatever you've got around the house, that's what we're gonna use. Um, the warp is held under some tension and so it just needs to be strong enough to be able to handle being abraded as you weave. So warp yarn is more picky and weft yarn, you can use pretty much anything. So if you have some yarn in your stash there that's strong and that is, can withhand a little bit of an abrasion, that would be a great choice for your warp. And you also need to have enough of it to kind of go back and forth, back and forth between 10 or 15 times. So you need a good chunk of it. So what I'm gonna be using is this twine I have here. And I'm gonna leave it on the spool and just work with the end attached because I'm not sure exactly how much I want, I'm going to need and I'd rather not have to cut it and tie it together. Although you could do that if you needed to. So when you're ready to attach your warp yarn to your box loom, you need to tie a knot on the end. So this is just a regular overhand knot. And I might just make one more on top of that so it's nice and big and not gonna go anywhere. And then I'm going to start what's called dressing my loom. It seems like a bit of a fancy term for what we're doing right now, but if you start using more complex looms, um, you can really see that the dressing your loom process is actually quite intense and can take several days depending on what you're up to. But not to worry, this is going to be nice and quick and painless, I hope, for our cardboard looms. So I'm going to show you this part here. Um, you can start dressing your loom on any of the corners that you have created with your slots here. So it doesn't matter. I usually start in the bottom right hand corner just out of habit. So that's what I'm going to do here. And I'm going to come under, I'm hoping you can see this well on this camera here, and slide the thread into that first slot. So the knot is holding it from going through there. And the tail's just sticking out, and that's fine. I can see a couple of people with boxes that look good. Thank you. And then you're going to bring your thread and put it through this far right slot on the top. So while you're doing this, you wanna use some tension. So you wanna have as snug tension as you can that's not going to make your knot slip out or make your cardboard box collapse or break your thread. But apart from that, nice and snug is great. So I'm going to um, go around the box now. And then when I come up again at this same spot, I'm going to go through my second slot. So what these slots are really doing for us is, I'm going to maybe come over here so you can see me a little bit better, is separating the threads so that they're about evenly spaced. So we're gonna go around again. Okay. So if you can see, I'm going all the way around and it's not perfect on the bottom. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> as long as it looks pretty good on the front. And then you keep going all the way around. You might have seen, if you've done any Google about looking for cardboard looms, you may have seen some that just kind of wrap around the edge and come back so all the yarn is on the surface. Um, and you could do that too, but why I like to go all the way around is so then I have extra yarn at the edges that I can use for fringe or to tie knots. It's nice not to have to kind of fiddle with the little bits at the end. So wrapping all the way around gives you a little bit more leeway there. So keep going until you've wrapped around and used up all of your 10 to 15 slots. And I'm gonna do that now. You're probably gonna get ahead of me because I'm talking and distracted.
If while you're doing this, if you have any questions about how to set up your loom or how to dress your cardboard loom, you're welcome to ask those questions. One thing that I get asked quite a bit is what do you do if you want to change colors or what do you do if you run out of thread? And I'm going to show you that now um, just because we will have an easier time later if that happens. So what I'm going to do is imagine that this is the end of my thread here and I want to change colors or change materials. Now I wouldn't recommend changing from like a linen that doesn't stretch at all to say a wool that stretches a good bit because then it's going to be difficult while you're weaving to kind of manage that change in tension. So I'm choosing to change from kind of a, a hemp linen blend to another linen and neither of those stretch hardly at all. So that way my warp will be consistent but I'll still have a bit of a change in texture which might make my weaving kind of fun. So I'm just tying a knot tying them together at the bottom of my box because I don't really want the knot as part of my loom. Just a simple knot there. You can see it's just at the bottom of my box, out of the way. And then I'm gonna continue as I was doing before. If you're noticing that you're getting a lot of sagging at the top, like you should, you should see them fairly straight. Like I have a little bit of sag in this very first one, which I'll adjust later, but it should be fairly taut and nice and straight across. Okay, so I've come to the end here. So I've got all my slots are full and I have changed colors in the middle or changed the colors the same, I've changed materials. And now I'm going to tie a knot at the end to stop it from unraveling. So I'm just gonna cut my edge. I gave myself enough of a tail that I can tie a knot. It's no fun trying to tie a knot with a tiny little piece at the end, so be generous with yourself. And then I'm going to actually tie this to the thread beside it here. And maybe I'll go over here again so you can kind of see how I do that. I'm trying to maintain as much of the tension as I can. Um, so just going under that one beside it. And through. And then again, to make a knot. You could really make a knot any kind of way that you want, as long as it's not gonna slide out of there. This isn't really a magic knot per se, but it works well for me. Okay. Now, I'm taking a look at it. It's not perfect, 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 but it's good enough for me to start weaving. And you can see what it looks like on the sides there. So does anyone have something that's starting to look like a loom? Okay, okay. We've got a couple, <laughs> very nice. All right. I want to say a couple things about materials while, while people are finishing up making their looms. Um, and that is that one of the exciting things that can happen in weaving is the change that happens once weaving is off the loom and washed. And we call this wet finishing. So some weavers believe that cloth isn't really cloth until it's wet finished. And that's because this process makes the fibers bind together and truly join to each other. And that's when the web of a weaving really becomes cloth. Um, so that's one of the reasons why weavers generally really like to use natural materials. So things like cotton or linen or wool. And that's because when you decide to wash your project after, you can get all sorts of beautiful effects that are purposely made through the combinations of different kinds of materials. 
um, for the project we're doing here today, uh, you may not want to wash it. Maybe you want to put it in a frame on your wall. Maybe you want to use it as a mug rug. Maybe you want to throw it out because you're embarrassed and start over. Any of those are totally okay. <laughs> um, or if you like, you can come visit me at Gather Textiles on the Tuesday or Thursday or Sunday and show it off to me. That would be fun too. Um, so for the purposes of what we're doing today, the wet finishing doesn't matter much, but if you were to make something like a blanket, for instance, you'd really want to consider how the fibers will react when they're washed. And so you'll need to think about things like how much do these different fibers shrink? Um, is, do my, does my warp shrink a lot, but my weft not? And how will that affect the size of my finished piece? Um, also, it's great to use things like natural fibers compared to acrylic yarns because they're better for the environment and will degrade after the fact, which even heirloom pieces that last generations, eventually, we do want them to degrade. Although there are times and places where acrylic is great. And one of those places is when you're finding reused things around your house that you can make um, into a secondhand weaving that holds different pieces of your own story that you found from around your home. And so I definitely would encourage you to use anything that you've got today. Okay, so we're feeling the tension as we go. We think that our warp is ready and we are ready to start weaving. So, I hope that you have something like a tapestry needle with you today. And that can be a tapestry needle that's a big wooden one like I have. I like this guy because it's nice and big and I don't lose it. And it has a nice big hole so I don't have to worry about threading it very much. But I also often will use this little guy. And this is probably what I imagine many of you might have and this is great too. If you don't have a tapestry needle at all, you can use your fingers or you can cut something out in the shape of this out of some stiff cardboard if you're feeling crafty. So either way, um, you will be able to weave today and using your fingers is a great place to start, especially if you have some thicker yarns to use. So I'm gonna start with some nice chunky yarn that I dyed ages ago. Um, because it's, I think, quite easy to see. And the first step is to thread your tapestry needle and you want a piece that is, I like to say between maybe 30 and 60 centimeters or so. With weaving, you can add yarn quite easily. So you don't have to worry about cutting and having to add more later. So this is my, my piece that I've got and I'm threading my needle here. Glad I can thread it. Sometimes when people are watching me, I just can't thread the needle, but so far so good. All right. Now I'm going to move some right under this camera so you can see me well over here. And this is the very first part of, part of my weaving. And so I need to do something to make sure that my weaving just doesn't fall apart. So to do that, I'm actually going to start weaving not right at the edge, but near the edge with my needle facing towards the right hand side. Now, if you're left handed, you can start on the other side if it's more comfortable for you. It really doesn't matter which side you start on. But we're going to start in plain weave. So what that means is over, under, over, under. And I'm going to start about four threads in here. Under, over, under. And it could be, you know, you could do a couple more stitches in. Um, you just want to have a couple. And once you see the next step, I think it'll make sense why I'm doing this. I'm going to tuck the tail out the back of the weaving. And then now I'm ready to start my first real row. So this is just kind of an anchor point. And now I'm going to start my first weaving row. So if I'm ended up going under my last warp thread, I'm going to go over it on my way back. So over, under, over, under, over, under until I get to the end and then pull through. And then here is where you can use your, your fork if you've got a fork with you. I have a kind of fancy little thing that's called a beater, um, but it's essentially a glorified pretty fork. And you can use this tool 
to pack down your thread all the way to the bottom of your box. Now, that looks pretty good. Now I'm just going to show you that very first part one more time because it's often somewhere where I find people kind of get stuck with how to start the thread. So I've threaded my needle. I start with my needle pointing to the outside edge. Go a couple of threads in over, under, over, under. Pull my thread almost all the way through, but not. And push the tail out the back. And then since I went over this warp thread on the edge, I'm gonna go under it on my way back first. And then alternating over, under, over, under, over, under until I get to the edge of my weaving. I'm gonna be careful not to over pull it or it'll come right out. And then you pack it down with your fork or your, your beater tool. And when you're ready for your next row, you wanna make sure you're paying attention to the very edge here. And if your thread went under the last warp thread, if your weft thread went under the last warp thread, then on your way back, you have to go over. But if yours is the opposite, say you, you're, you ended on top, then you start by going under. So it's important that it's the opposite so that you catch this edge thread, which in weaving, we call this the selvage thread, the selvage edge. So now I'm going back, same idea, over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under. Now it's tempting to pull this really snug because it can be kind of satisfying to pull it snug. However, if you do that, you'll find that your weaving gets narrower and narrower and narrower all the way up to the top. And then you will have a very skinny weaving at the top, which maybe that's what you want. If so, great. But if you want a more even weaving, I recommend trying to keep that nice and loose and using this little angle here to make sure that there's enough weft yarn to really go over and under each warp thread there. And you can pack it in. So if you're using a really fine thread, it can take a few passes back and forth to make it look like you've got anything. And if you're finding that's a situation for you, one trick is to double or triple up your thread. So if you just have something really fine, you can use several pieces together to make it bigger. Um, that's often what I do if I'm near the end of a workshop and people are having a hard time finishing then all of a sudden we just start using a lot thicker thread and it goes a lot faster. So it's a quick little trick if you're um, wanting to speed things up a little bit. But on that note, um, I do think that weaving is one of the few things in life that's allowed to be slow and that is just totally fine. I think it's kind of a way of engaging, but also um, engaging with the making of a fabric, but also resisting kind of that idea of mass production. And so if you're um, finding yourself feeling like you're not making things fast enough, try and just kind of reframe how you think about um, weaving and see if you can find some enjoyment in the actual process of it. Because, hey, if we wanted to make cloth as fast as possible, we'd be, you know, ordering something <laughs> online or using some kind of fancy tool and we're just making cloth by hand today. So the same thing, I've got a bit of an angle here, over, under, over, under, packing it in. And you can see it, I have something that almost looks like cloth now. And I'm coming near the end of my tail. So when I get to the end of my weft yarn here, I'll show you how to transition into a new piece of yarn. Okay, so I, I know I don't have enough to go all the way back with this tiny little piece here. So what I'm gonna do is just go back as far as I can go and I'm just gonna use my fingers because my needle would just get in the way at this point. And then I'm just gonna push it down and tuck the tail out the back. And then I'm gonna get my next piece. So I'm gonna to decide to use a different type of yarn this time and cut another piece, maybe just a little longer than the one before, but you can choose whatever length you want based on how much of that section you wanna weave. So 
So I've threaded my needle and I'm ready to start weaving again. Now I wanna overlap that part that I just did by about half an inch or an inch or so. That way it doesn't unravel. There's a couple of different ways to start new th threads. I could start a totally new thread on the opposite side if I wanted, but I'm just gonna show you the very simple way of just overlapping about an inch because I find it's sort of the easiest and what I end up doing most often myself. So I'm gonna start this row following the same over under pattern as I was using before. So I'm following the exact pattern of that thread that just ended there. But then I'm gonna keep going with it. And then when I pull this thread through, I'm gonna leave it overlapping just a little bit there. So when I pack it down, you can see there's this one or two threads where I have both the blue and the new white one going the same direction. So I'm hoping that you can kind of see that, um, but I'm gonna hold it up to the bigger. I don't think the camera's bigger for you here too. So you can kind of see how I've doubled up in that spot right there. And then continue as you were going. So I'm going over this salvage thread. So my next row goes underneath. And you can see I'm using my needle kind of in the center here and then packing it down. And I'm doing that because in the center is where the warp threads have the most give. Um, and so it's easier to get my needle through. It can be tempting and I've seen lots of people um, they put their needle right above where they want the thread to be. And that actually puts extra strain on the warp threads and can end up making things stretch out more. So does anyone have anything weird going on? Any problems, <laughs> any funky things <laughs> that we should look at? Feel free I, to- I have a quick question. I don't have a problem, but I grabbed a big, piece of thread and I don't know how when I'm done it do I tie do I make a knot I've missed that part yeah great question okay let's just pretend that mine ended again and I'll show you okay all right so this is going to this thread's going to end really quick here and I think I have enough for maybe one more row. Let's see. Yeah. So I'm packing this down fairly tight so I can barely see my warp um, through it. But depending on the, the size of your warp and weft, you might be able to see your warp more or less. It's just an aside. Um, okay, so I'm getting towards the end of this thread. And this one's gonna end just right in the middle. And so when I add my next one in, say I'm gonna use more of the same thread here. I'm just gonna start about an inch back. So I overlap a little bit. I'm gonna not pack them in just so that you can see better visually kind of how I'm adding this next one. So both tails get pushed out the back of the weaving and the threads overlap by about an inch. And that's enough to be strong enough to hold the weaving together. Now, it definitely depends on the materials you're using. If you're using a really slippery silk, this might not do the trick and you might need to overlap more um, or use a different technique. But for most fibers and for what we're doing today, that should be strong enough. If you're using wool, wool really likes to cling to itself quite well. And so you can get away with quite a lot, but with more slippery kinds of fibers, um, they don't always want to hold together quite the same. 
Now, when you're beating down, you can get all sorts of different kinds of effects. So I've used a fairly light beat up until now, um, but I could really squish these in like crazy and make a much more tightly packed weaving if I wanted to. And it really depends what you are trying to make. Generally, um, in weaving, you aim for what's called a 50-50 weave, which means that the density of the warp and weft are the same. Um, but often with the tapestry style of weaving, you use a lot more weft than you do warp. Um, and that's just because it's often a way to use um, to make images and where you want to be changing what the warp or what the um, weaving looks like throughout the process. So you don't want that consistency of the same color everywhere. Um, but for what we're doing today, if you have a 50-50 kind of um, balance or if you have a lot more weft facing, either of those is great. So after you feel like you kind of have the hang of plain weave, it's a great opportunity to start changing some things. Like what if you were to change your material, start using something a lot finer or a lot thicker? Or what if you were to start changing the way that you go over and under the warp threads? Maybe you go over two warp threads than under one, over two under one then you'd create a different kind of pattern. Um, depending on the material that I'm using, I will often change the weave structure. So I've been using plain weave up until this point, but soon I'm gonna add in some fabric strips that I had lying around. And I'm gonna use a different weave structure there because it's gonna be a really thick piece that I don't think would work very well in plain weave. You can see this, this um, weft thread that I'm using right now is kind of a thick and thin. So some areas are really poofy and some areas are really fine. And so it'll kind of change how my weaving looks throughout, but that's okay. I know it's gonna kind of even out as I go. If you're finding things are starting to slip around, like sometimes as you weave your, um, warp threads will get a little bit looser or they won't seem to be holding together as well. You can adjust things by just pulling on your warp threads on the side of your box. And I'm just doing that a little bit right now to make sure my tension's still good. And it looks like it's okay. There are lots of different ways to make this kind of weaving more efficient and lots of different add-ons that you can use to a simple loom. Um, and I'll show you one of those little tricks. Okay, and so one of the little tricks to be a little bit more efficient is if you have an extra needle or if you have a popsicle stick or if you have a pencil or something that's long and skinny, what you can do is weave it in over, under, over, under, all the way across, and then turn it so you have a little bit of a space between the sets of threads. And kind of push it to the back of your loom. I'm just going to show what I've done here up close so you can see. You can kind of see how that creates this space. It's called, a, in weaving, we call this a shed between the sets of threads. So now when you use your tapestry needle, I'm going to switch to my finer one here because I used my other one. Then you can pass it through easily without having to go over, under, over, under every time. It's just a simple pass through. So it's a great little trick. However, it's not perfect because it doesn't work going the other direction. So it only really helps you out for every second pass. Or in weaving, we use the word pick, every second pick, because I can't use it to go back this way. Um, so I would have to still kind of normally go this direction. But it's a, it's a tool that speeds things up, I think maybe 20% or something. So it can be helpful. 
as you're designing your little weaving here to keep in mind that although we're starting right at the very base here, we're not gonna be able to weave all the way to the very top um, because once you get to the, near the top, it starts to get really tricky to get your needle in there. It's not impossible, but it's just not comfortable. And I usually find when I get about, you know, three quarters of the way up, it's time to call it. And so I'm going to use this little trick again here by passing through this space. It makes it a little bit faster. And then I'm going to take that out because you've seen how that works. And I think it's a little bit easier to show you what's going on without it. Okay, I'm going to tuck this tail in here and then I'm going to show you what I'll do with some fabric here. All right. So you might have a strip of fabric like this that you have or that you can cut. Um, or you might have just a really chunky piece of yarn that you want to use for this. Or you might have something like a chocolate bar wrapper or <laughs> something creative you want to, a feather, I don't know, something that you want to try um, incorporating, something that you have lying around the house. Um, and you can use your tapestry needle if it'll fit, but I'm just gonna use my fingers because I don't think that I'm gonna have room in my tapestry needle. And for this part, I'm going to um, actually not go over and under one at a time, but I'm gonna jump over two at a time. So I'm gonna start by going under one to just secure it. Then I'm gonna go over two threads, under one thread over two threads, under one, over two, under one, over two, under one. And you can see that it's going to show this warp here, which is fine because I kind of like how that looks, I think. And then I'm going to cut this tail. You could, I'm going to leave a bit of it hanging because kind of what I feel like doing today, but you could cut it fairly close if you wanted. And I'm not going to beat this in because it's going to get squished in by the next row that I use. So I'm going to cut a bit more yarn and I'm going to start weaving on top of that row. Now the over two under one thing is just kind of an arbitrary choice that I made. You could try all sorts of things. You could go over six under two. You could um, kind of do whatever you want, maybe even changing it as you go to kind of see what happens when you change how you're interlacing the warp and the weft together. Okay, I'm going to um, start again on top of this. So because I'm starting a new thread, I'm starting with my needle facing out again. I'm gonna tuck that tail in. So at this point, you can feel free to start experimenting with different ways of going over and under each warp thread, or you can stick kind of following along with me, whatever you prefer. All right, and as I beat this piece in, I'm gonna squish this fabric down a bit too. And that's gonna hold it in place and also kind of make it pop out a little. And it's gonna do that a little bit more every pass that I do here for the next little bit. So using things like rags that you have around the house is something that weavers have done for generations making rugs out of rags um, is a really popular weaving technique. And it's something that we've been doing in the shop at Gather Textiles a lot lately. So if you're interested in that, you can come check out what we've been working on. There's also some really fabulous rag rug weavers that are part of the Edmonton Weavers Guild. And so once they start to open up again, hopefully, in the fall, I think. Um, it's worth going in and meeting some of the weavers there and seeing what they're up to because they've always got something new and exciting.
Okay, so now that this fabric is pretty securely put in there, you can kind of mess around with it. Like maybe you want it to kind of bubble out a little more. You can play with that if you want, or if you like it as is, great, you can keep weaving. There are so many different kinds of tapestry techniques. One thing that you could try if you have extra tapestry needles is weaving with two different um, needles at the same time. Um, I'm not gonna demo that today, but that's something that you can do by using two different colors together and alternating, say like white, blue, white, blue, white, blue, and you can get different kinds of effects that way. I'm going to show you though how to do a technique called a riot, making a raya knot. Um, I think quite a few people lately have asked me about making wall hangings and making raya knots is a really popular technique used for making wall hangings because it adds extra fringe. Um, so if you notice what I just did there, I'm, my weaving got a bit too tight so I just kind of took it out and then putting it back in because I saw it sort of pulling in on the sides. It's really tricky not to get your weaving to pull in on the sides. It kind of wants to do that. So if you're finding yours is coming in on the sides, don't give yourself too hard a time about it because it's just a part of the process. All right, Raya knots. So I need something that's nice and easy to see for you. So I'm going to choose my blue again. Okay. So this is a little tricky to learn via a screen, I'm sure. So I'll do it a couple of times and you can see if you can follow me here. So you can choose any spot where you want to have a little bit of extra fringe. And for this example, I'm gonna try and have it in the middle of my little weaving. So I'm gonna see where is the middle here. Okay, it's about right here. So I'm gonna choose these two warp threads and just so you can kind of see which two I'm choosing, I'm gonna put my little beater there. Then I have this these two short pieces of yarn here and you could use more than two or you could just use one. It doesn't matter, I'm just using two to get a little bit more bulk. And what you do is take each tail and bring them up behind the two warp threads that you've chosen, behind and through the center. Coming from behind, through that center and out. Kind of makes this Lululemon shape, you could say. Then pull it nice and snug. And you've got yourself a little raya knot and you can cut your fringe right away if you want. So this is how the whole rugs are made using this technique. That's just one little baby raya knot. I'll show you another time because it's a little bit tricky to follow. And then we'll see if anyone can show me a Raya knot after this for a gold star. <laughs> okay, so picking your two threads somewhere in the middle of your weaving if you like, or three, I've got three this time. Taking the tails, coming up through the center and to the outside. And then doing the same thing with the other side, around and through the center to the outside. 
And before I tighten it, I'm just going to hold it up to the camera so you can kind of see the shape. Whoop. Maybe. Let me try that again. And then you can pull it snug. All right. So you can do a whole row of those if you like, or you can choose not to do them at all. I'm going to take mine out just so it's easy for you to see the rest of my weaving here. Do we have any other any other questions about weaving or about your warp tension or about changing colors or about using different materials or about rhinots or any of the above? You'll, you're welcome to type a question in the chat or ask. I have a quick question about knots. Sure. Are there other knots that people use for a woven, like a weave like this? Or is it just that one style of knot that works? Oh, there are, there are whole books written on weaving knots and on knots in general. Um, in fact, if you're really interested in knots, I would actually recommend looking at the artist Lise Silva is her name, L-I-S-E-S-I-L-V-A. She has a whole book on, um, she's written on different kinds of knots and their history and their use and their meaning. Um, that's really fantastic. One of the first knots that I always teach in my weaving classes is a, a slip knot because it's such a handy knot to know that will undo itself. Um, it's, it's not really used for like this specific kind of weaving that we're doing right now, but it's such a handy thing. I just think it's handy kind of in everyday life to know a slip knot. So many of you probably already do, um, but if you don't, I'll do a little slip note, slip knot demo for you. So you have a loop of thread, cross, and then you pull the thread from behind through. And what makes it great is that you can just undo it and there's nothing there. So you have your loop of thread, cross it, reach back to the thread behind. <laughs> Little knots like this are really tricky to, to learn via um, screens. So happy to show any passerby a slip knot <laughs> at any time. And I'm sure there's probably a good, a good Google um, image search for this too, but super handy. In the loom setup process, slip knots are used all of the time. And in weaving, there's a, a saying that I think is, was started by a weaver named Laura Fry, and it's that um, never tie a knot where a bow will do. And I think it's used because in weaving, you never really want to have to deal with knots and getting scissors near your warp and worrying about um, potentially cutting your warp. That can be one of the most frustrating things as a weaver. Um, broken threads and constantly fixing broken threads. Shout out to Erin if she's in <laughs> listening to this. Um, we've had a lot of- um, Never happened to me. <laughs> there's a lot, sometimes when new weavers are using complicated looms, threads are just kind of snapping everywhere. And so it becomes kind of a, a constant thing in the studio is, is fixing that. So I'm going I to- I wanted to ask, sorry. Oh. Um, you were just talking about um, your weaving sucking in. I don't know if you can see us, but I'm definitely having that. Let me see. If I can. Oh, it's not so bad, but is the secret just like continuing to pull them out? I, I know you were talking about this, yeah. but I missed it. So there's a couple of things. Um, one is to think about what materials you're using. Like there's lots of there's lots of little things. If you're using something stretchy like wool and your warp is something that's not stretchy. Often the stretchy one likes to pull in a lot. So no matter what you do, it's gonna be kind of fighting 
your warp. Um, but you can also just make that angle that you're pulling the thread bigger. And so that should help a little bit. The thing is, especially with a tiny loom like this, once you start getting that drawing in, draw, draw in is the fancy weaving term for that, um, is you can't really undo it. So once it's started to come in, you can't really push it back out very easily. You can just stop it from coming in more. So at this stage, embrace, embrace your... It's gonna be an hourglass weaving. <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm going to show um, how to remove your weaving. So I'm going to actually do a little cooking show swap here and bring in the little example weaving I made um, a while back to show how you would actually remove your weaving um, from your box because we are getting near the end of our time here. Um, so I'm gonna say that this weaving is done for now. And you can see in this one, I've done the little, um, the kind of fabric approach here. And I've also done a similar sort of approach using a bundle of thin fibers together. So that's another thing you could try. Um, but I'm going to take it off the loom by turning my box upside down and snipping all of these threads on the back. So this can be kind of scary. I promise your weaving won't fall apart too much. So I'm gonna just slip my scissors in the back here. Oh, and a nice satisfying snip for you. And then flip it back to the front. And I don't like to just rip it off right away because it's nice to have a little bit of the stability of the loom while I'm doing the little knots on the edges. And so I'm gonna finish this one as if it was gonna be like a little mug rug or coaster or something, or just a little weirdly shaped bookmark potentially. Um, and so to do that, what I'm gonna do is tie my warp ends off in little knots in groups of, let's say maybe, groups of four, so that it doesn't take me too long here. So I would just take off the four that I'm going to tie. And because I've had these wrap all the way around my box, they're long enough that I can actually tie a knot with them. So in some weaving looms um, that you'll see, or some styles of frame looms, you won't have this extra and you'll wanna make sure that you don't weave right to the edge because there's nothing more uncomfortable than tying a knot with like a one inch of yarn. If you've done any kind of fiber related work, you'll probably empathize with that statement. So I'm just using a simple overhand knot here. Although I should say, nothing is necessarily simple until you've done it a few times, but it's not a, any particular weaving related knot, just an overhand knot. And that should be enough to secure the edges. So I'm gonna take the next four and I'm doing all of one side first and then I'll do the other side. So if you wanna keep working on yours and potentially take it off of your loom later. That's totally fine. But I just wanna show you how that process works so that you can do it on your own. So I didn't plan this, but I actually have a, a warp number that's divisible by four. So each one has four threads in it. If that's not the case and you didn't luck out like I did, you can just have the edge have a smaller number than the rest of them. And usually you won't really notice, but you can plan ahead and kind of have a number that's divisible by the number of warp threads you chose if you are a planner. So I'm actually gonna take out the little knot that I used to secure my warp when I was making this weaving because I don't want that extra knot in the corner there. Luckily, it's not too tight. Okay, so I've got one side done. Now, if 
if I wanted to, if I was very proud of my little weaving, as maybe some of you will be, and I want it, and you want to display it somehow, you could take this top part here and attach it to something like a dowel, or um, you could find a way to kind of fold it over and frame it if you wanted. Um, but for the purposes of this, I'm going to tie more knots, but now would be a good time to kind of decide, okay, what am I going to do with my weaving before you go ahead and totally take it off the loom. Once it's off the loom, um, then you don't really have the organization of the warp threads being all spread out nice and evenly. So it's kind of now's your, your time to make a decision on what you want to do with it. So I'm just going to do the same thing on this side for our purposes here. Now that it's not, not secure on this side, it's a little bit trickier to do these ties. So it's not too bad. This is a pretty stiff warp that I use, so it's going to cooperate pretty well. But if it's sliding all over the place, you can, um, you can take it off the loom and just put a heavy book on part of the weaving or something so it's not moving around on you too much. In the weavings that are on display at the AGA right now as part of the scene exhibition, I'm using all sorts of different materials like um, a lot of them are made out of paper. So they're actually yarn that's been spun not by me but by others um, in, from paper. And paper works really well with linen because neither of those fibers stretch. So I was experimenting with a bunch of different things like um, transparency where you can kind of see through the weaving, but it still holds its structure. So if you're interested in kind of the different forms that weaving can take, um, and sometimes they don't necessarily have to be practical forms, um, you might be interested to kind of closely look. And now that you've done this, you'll have a better idea of how those would have been made. Although um, the weavings in the exhibition were made on a four shaft loom, so that's a, a floor loom where I would use my feet and my hands together. And um, it's a lot more efficient than what we're doing. And there's a lot more pattern capabilities, but there are times when weaving like this kind of slowly by hand is really the best choice depending on what kind of pattern you wanna make or what you have available to you. Um, in weaving, we often talk about um, using the loom to its maximum capacity is really the best kind of way to use a weaving loom. So if you're making a small tapestry, but you're using a huge loom, you're actually not going to be doing yourselves any favors. <laughs> so you, if you want to make, um, you want to be using the loom that's appropriate for your the kind of project you want to make. So if you are interested in kind of looking at different kinds of looms or trying different kinds of looms out, we have all sorts of looms on display um, in the studio on, at Gather Textiles on Fort Road and you're welcome to kind of swing by and give them a try and we love to kind of show people um, all of our different samples and what's available um, for all different kinds of weaving. All right so I have my my little weaving is free of its loom now. And I'm just going to tighten up these little knots and then I'll trim them. So you can have your fringe as, as long or short as you want it to be. I'm going to go with kind of short, I think, for this. All right, now, if you wanted to, now would be a good time to take your weaving and bring it to the ironing board and give it a nice steam press if you want it to lay nice and flat. Um, you can also see this is the back of my weaving, which is looking a little bit sloppy right now. 
So in order to fix it up, you can actually cut all of these tails flush. And I know people are often hesitant to do this because it seems like it'll just unravel, but that's kind of the beautiful thing about weaving compared to some other kinds of textile crafts is you don't have to worry too much about unraveling, especially if you're gonna give your project um, a wet finish or a, a steam um, because the fibers will bind to each other and they will not unravel. Assuming that you've done a good job of overlapping your fibers when you change colors, etc. Okay, so that's looking a bit better now that I've trimmed it all up on the side. That's that. So if there's if there's other questions, I'm happy to answer them, um, weaving weaving technique related or otherwise. But if not, I think Michael, that's that's all I've got. Well, I have more questions, of course. Uh, if anyone wants to add a question, uh, you can add it in the chat and I can read it out, or you can just simply uh, interject. That's totally cool as well. Uh, I'm just going to let people know that Helen has put a little survey in our chat. So if you like this program or if you have some constructive feedback, please let us know. Uh, so my question is a little bit about the exhibition. So the exhibition is called The Scene. And it's kind of talking about the Edmonton art scene, what's going on in the Edmonton art scene. And one of the things that kind of made me think during your presentation was about the Edmonton textile art scene. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I feel like the textile art scene in Edmonton is really growing. Um, when I first started learning to weave, it was really just like the Edmonton Weavers Guild was the place and kind of the one and only place that I knew of um, that you could learn to weave. But now there's several places in the city where you can learn to weave and there's a growing interest in kind of weaving and weaving adjacent practices. There's a bunch of people um, interested in punch needle and rug hooking and all sorts of different um, types of textile related crafts and we sort of see them coming through the door at Gather and that's really been kind of some of the most exciting parts of my <laughs> COVID times because I haven't been able to see people quite as much but now and then if somebody came through the door with a project that they've been working on I am encouraged to see that people have been crafting like crazy during <laughs> the pandemic and um, I think because of that there's this sort of renewed energy around making things in the city and so I would strongly encourage people to um, get involved I think um, there's there's specific clubs like for different I think there's um there is a rug hooking guild as well there's a needle craft guild I'm not sure if it's called needle craft or like um needle work or something so if somebody might know that's here <laughs> um and there's a a bunch of other like kind of smaller groups that will um meet up there's a group called I think they're called making space um, that they're doing a lot of textile related dyeing workshops lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually one of my coworkers works for uh, Making Space. So I know a little bit about that, which is really exciting uh, uh, at the AGA. So I guess, does needle anyone, craft. what? Needlecraft, somebody, somebody helped me out with that. I'm into Needlecraft Field. Yeah, it's really fascinating. One of the things, so I'm a textile artist as well. And one of the things that I think is kind of really popular is uh, show, is uh, making it more popular is social media. Is that is that part of it as well? Or is it just like COVID times? I, I think it's both. Um, yeah, I have like mixed feelings about this. I mean, I'm so inspired by people on social media, but I also feel like it can kind of lead to this spiral of like, everybody doing the same kinds of things and mm -hmm. like sort of um, Pinterestizing, is that, can that be a word? Of That's a word. And making and um, sometimes it can lead to problems like um, it being difficult to attribute certain kinds of skills and techniques to certain groups. And so there's definitely pros and cons of social media, but I mean, yeah, if you're looking for inspiration, you don't have to look very hard. And especially as a way of kind of connecting to other makers around the world, it's been um, kind of a unique opportunity, I think, 
just because now it just seems easier to reach out to someone in a different area. Um, I've had, I actually had a really amazing um, video call with my Moroccan weaver friend at like three in the morning <laughs> that I never would have thought to do pre-COVID. I wouldn't have even um, thought to like try that, but because there was so much virtual programming happening, I thought, you know what, like, why not? Like I can connect to somebody on the other side of the world. I mean, it will be a late night, but it's totally worth it. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of, yeah, a lot of those connections that are like through kind of through social media or through um, the online connections that people have been able to make have made the world a lot smaller and a lot more um, kind of exciting collaborations have been happening too. Yeah, I have a question from Arlene. Ar Arlene is asking, is the scene a virtual exhibition? I don't know, it's in person and it's, and it's open to the public. Um, yeah, it was, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> we waited a long time for this exhibition. Um, so when it finally opened, it was sort of like, oh, we're actually gonna get to see this for real. And so it's been, yeah, really cool to actually be able to go and see the work of the other artists um, in the show. I'd strongly recommend a visit. Um, mm -hmm. There's some other really great work on display at the AGA as well. If you, they haven't advertised it a whole lot, but there's a Picasso exhibit right now, which is really. <laughs> <funny. Yeah. laughs> we do have a Picasso exhibit. That's for sure. We also have this really great show called Black Every Day which is on our second floor, which is the 15th anniversary of Five Artists, One Love. So yeah, definitely encourage people to, uh, to check, out, check out the AGA. Um, Helen just put in a link to learn more about the scene. And I guess, uh, Kim, do you have anything else to say? Or should we wrap it up? One more thing I kind of want to say is, uh, I, I'm, this is what I made. I'm really curious what other people made. So if you want to show us maybe in the screen, or maybe you can send an image to the Facebook event uh, for this. Uh, I'm just so curious what people made. And I'm sure Kim would love to see. Yes, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, wow, amazing. Uh, wow, people did amazing. This is so incredible. Well, I guess I'll just say a big thank you uh, for myself and everyone at the AGA. Thank you so much for joining us. It looked like people had a lot of fun. Kim, you've uh, given so much great information about weaving and looms and it's so fantastic to have you in the show and in this program. Uh, big thank you to Helen uh, who runs uh, the Zoom and does all our digital stuff. So, um, you know, I can't wait to see everyone's weaving and I guess we'll leave it there. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>